by just briefly uh, introducing. Sitting immediately next to me is Dr. Tom Zhang. Is that correct? Okay. Dr. Zhang is a recognized expert in human resources and talent acquisition in Silicon Valley. So he's representing the corporations, the big business. Tom helped build the early Asia Pacific team in China, Japan, Australia, and uh, for Tesla Motors. Prior to Tesla, he worked at HR staffing at Google and Tencent, is that Tencent America? His other areas of expertise include US Chinese labor law compliance, executive search, executive compensation, and career counseling. We have a lot in common. He taught at San Jose State. He received his doctorate in electrical engineering from Zhengzhang. Zhengzhang, is that okay? Am I saying it okay? University. Sitting next to him is a friend of mine, somebody that is kind to come down from uh, way up north, as it were, is uh, E.J. Dieterle. And E.J. is the president and CEO of Yes Partners, which is a global executive uh, search firm. He grew up in Germany. He served as country manager, managing director, and president for companies in the UK, Japan, South Korea, and New York. Um, and to also New Jersey. Also New Jersey, what can I tell you? He managed organizations of 300 plus people, and his initial expertise was in supply chain management, transportation, and logistics. He's local in Silicon Valley since 20, uh, 2002. His German is native, but besides English, this is an amazing kind of a thing. He also communicates in Spanish, French, and Japanese. He also is a fabulous accordion player because <laughs> our birthdays, <laughs> our birthdays are, are on the same day or right near each other. And so I had a party one year and he and his wife came and they surprised me with him playing the accordion. He's a great accordion player, guys. Um, he's a member of the service organization Rotary, as am I, but he's been the, the president of his club in 2009-10. Uh, He's also a member of the National Association of Corporate Directors. I think that's where I originally met you when I, I was talking on a panel. And he's also board of director in an early stage medical device company. And he's the advisor, as you can imagine, to many startups. He moderated HR-related panels for a number of organizations, including the VC Task Force, the NCHRA uh, HR Association. He co-chaired uh, HR with GABA. Uh, he brought me into that organization years ago as a member of that, the German American uh, Business Association. He presented on various topics, including HR and international business, to the Nihon, Nihon, is that a, Nihon University in Tokyo, to UC Berkeley, and to DeVry, where I also taught, and has conducted workshops on market entry in Japan, South Korea, and US market entry in Europe. He's been a mentor for recruiting and startup teams since day one, with the German Accelerator in the Silicon Valley. And he goes all around the world bringing in the high-tech executive people that we so desperately need in Silicon Valley. So a little just plug, there's something with our education system that's sadly lacking. <laughs> we'll get to that. Okay, sitting next to him is a young lady that I just met recently named Karen Rosen. Karen is an attorney. And she's also the treasurer of uh, women in international trade. Now, that's not witty. That's women in international trade. And uh, she's studying for her MBA in global impact management, corporate risk, and compliance from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey. And I asked her to come representing that university. Uh, she wants to use her experience and skills to serve clients by developing timely strategic international trade transaction solutions, that's a mouthful, as part of a team. She's lived and worked in Switzerland, Germany, Japan, and several regions of the United States. So that's a lovely global perspective. She earned her uh, Juris Doctorate from Rutgers and is um, admitted to practice in Texas. Why Texas? Well, uh, my family had the time to spend there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, she, she, uh, and as you can tell from the places she lives, she loves traveling. Um, so that is about her. Next to her is sitting Julie Ann Bisdell. Is that how you pronounce it? Bisdell. 
um, who study international economics and politics as an undergraduate, and her emphasis was cross-cultural communications. She studied at, I can't pronounce this correctly, uh, at some university in Guatemala, and taught in Guatemala, uh, Guadalajara, not Guatemala, Guadalajara, wrong, what can I tell you? After receiving her teaching credentials, she went on to get an MA in public administration. In 1996, she began teaching in Santa Clara Unified School District, and she's currently the career technical education coordinator for the school district. So she's going to be representing education K through 12, all of it. Um, career technical education in, in the Santa Clara Unified School District strives to ensure that all students, pre-K to adults, participate in a variety of learning experiences that enable them to develop and demonstrate 21st century skills while exploring career pathways that are responsive to industry needs and personal aspirations. So as you can see, the educators and uh, people in the, in the real world looking for the right candidates. And finally, and, and you know, last but not least kind of a thing, is uh, Jeff. Jeff Palin, 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 Jeff pa sounds very Bostonian. Jeff Palin is a graduate of Boston University with a bachelor's degree, uh, and then uh, he had his, his almost doctorate from the University of Wisconsin um, in the field of mathematical logic and recursion theory. I have no idea what that means. He'll tell us later. He left academia to pursue his passion for music, and this led to a management career in the audiovisual industry. This is an interesting background, isn't it? During this time, he returned to Boston U to earn his MBA, and then in, managed the Western Hemisphere operations of a Japanese firm sitting on the board of directors for strategic planning in Japan. After doing that for about 20 years, he began teaching graduate courses in management at several Bay Area universities. From teaching, he moved into, this guy's moved, he's moved into education administration, first at Berkeley and then at uh, San Jose Evergreen Community College as Dean of Workforce and Economic Development. He, he understands the value of industry and in, in, I can't speak today, engagement in education. He's now the academic dean at Mission College, so he's going to be representing the college community for us today, heading the business technology and kinesiology division, internship, apprenticeship, and employment. So it's kind of a perfect fit for our panel today. Um, he says that some attributes of success are the students improving their lives sufficiently to become self-sustaining members of society. Our state government, I'm quoting something that he wrote, our state government is serious about the role of the community college as an engine of economic development. Given the international flavor of the business ecosystem here in the heart of Silicon Valley and the tremendous diversity of the student population at Mission College, Dean pa uh, Palin looks forward to participating in the panel today discussing the value of our programs in preparing students for the global workforce. So I hope you agree with me. We have a very diverse and very distinguished panel. And so I have a bunch of questions. But I want to tell you what I'm hoping for, for, for today, just to, to set a kind of a parameter around this, is um, how do we marry the needs of the business community with what we're doing in academia. That kind of piece one. And piece two is how do we prepare our kids today to both to live and work in a in a global environment because that's certainly what we're doing today. And so that's kind of the overall theme of, of where we're going. And um, I put, I prepared a series of questions and I think I sent them to all of you. But I'm not going to ask you each to answer the same question. That drives me crazy. So I, you know, we're going to be a little bit selective about this, or else we'll be here to midnight. But my first question is to each of you. Tell us a little about yourself as it pertains to providing today's students the proper educational background to live and work in an international environment. Just a few words that are different from what I read in your bio. Why don't you start? I have the microphone. <laughs> so um, in thinking about this question, I realized that I should communicate to all of you. Um, I'm very passionate about the, the lessons from literature, 
regarding leadership, and I can cite many references from the writings of Shakespeare, Lao Tzu, John Locke, Sophocles, Conrad, and so forth. In a meeting just yesterday with an employer, a company, the executives of that company expressed to me concern about how education today prepares students with the hard skills they need to do the job, but the soft skills of human interaction don't receive enough attention. That's and I'd me, like folks. to change that. <laughs> so I then just thought, despite our differences in culture and language around the world, there are certain norms and standards of leadership that apply across all cultures. And that's part of what education can help with. Thank you. That's a great start. Julie, why don't you take the mic and answer this one. How have the changes in Silicon Valley impacted the courses at your schools and the way uh, that you think you personally think about education? And can you describe some of the changes that have been happening sure. in the school um, system? I'm a product of Santa Clara Unified. So I have some history there um, going way back. Um, high school looks different now, um, yet there's some things very familiar. Um, curriculum at the high school level, very much dictated by our UC system, which sometimes doesn't leave a lot of room for more work-based experiential learning. We'd like to get them out in the internships or working on those soft skills like you spoke of. Um, it's um, pretty rigid curriculum. Un Again, the rigor is there, but we wonder if it's missing some of the aspects that are reflective of our economy now. Um, so I will say that we have career skills that go K through pre-K, pre-K through our adult programs that we emphasize. Um, I know we've talked about what a second grade classroom looks like now, and we talk about those skills all the way up. Um, we are hoping that we have more connections with industry to have our students practice it. What goes on in the four walls of a classroom, we can simulate, we can talk about it, but they need to do it. They need to practice it. They need to see it. So I think that's really where we're trying to put a lot of our effort um, in Santa Clara Unified is getting our students off campus to experience these um, practicing soft skills because we know whether they're going to be staying local and working in um, Variety of, um, variety of environments, whether it's global or not, they're going to need all of these skills. And the more practice, the better. So, don't, don't sure. the mic yet. Wait a minute. So, just as a follow up to that, sure. you know, just part of a conversation you and I were having out there, mm -hmm. is what is being taught the younger kids in terms of diversity, in terms of accepting differences? Um, our classes. Um, our population is Santa Clara Unified, 93 languages in our school district, so their classroom is very diverse um, by default. Um, so some things don't um, happen, they happen organically, right? That we, there's lots of, I, I think that they are very um, intentional in some of the talk about diversity. However, when what their classroom looks like, looks like what their um, environment and a work, whatever work they pursue is going to look like. Um, we do value second, third, fourth languages. That's something that um, we have a seal of biliteracy. There, there's many ways we're trying to um, support student um, what assets they have and say how in a global community, how you're going to be recognized and valued and what are things that you should, um, you know, you have so many opportunities and look at everything that you have. And that does start in kindergarten. Um, it's, those aren't deficits, those are of, of high value. Um, so. All right, that's what I'm to Karen. Karen, one of the things that you were talking to when you and I met, you were talking about some, uh, statistics that were being uh, acquired. What are some of the statistics that you, you're aware of in terms of how teaching different languages, te teaching diversity, how they've uh, kind of impacted the school world? The, we have, at, at Mid Middlebury Institute, we have a strong data analysis uh, courses that are designed to take into account data that comes from all over the world. We have access to the Bloomberg Terminal as part of the uh, MBA class, MBA program, and of course the MBA, the, the Bloomberg Terminal is open to all the graduate programs from the, uh, from the policy programs to the non-proliferation programs. And we have uh, 
uh, we have tech classes, uh, basically tech in five minutes or tech, tech in an hour classes every Friday that are provided by uh, volunteers actually from our school, from our class community uh, students. And we learn R, we have cl classes in R that do network analysis, uh, and network analysis is being used at, in every uh, industry industry uh, segment to understand the 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 connections, the global connections that 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 pharmaceuticals have among each other, the the research that pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies choose to share can be accessed globally now. For, for maybe some time, you know, of course, for a price uh, and among collaborators. But these collaborations, uh, sharing data, uh, can actually uh, enhance our business program and they enhance the educational and the global uh, aspects of all education at M Middlebury Institute of International Studies. It just, it just permeates the entire, every aspect of the program from studying the in international company, a company with a global presence in, in multiple jurisdictions, uh, regulation, data, uh, of course markets, uh, the international markets, and that's, it's just, it's just uh, uh, boiled down to global, global responses. And we now, are, it's very explicit and has been for a while, but it's just, a concentrated program that really emphasizes the impact of one event in a remote, maybe remote part of the world that the public isn't aware of, but the business community is definitely aware of how um, these events uh, and circumstances and regulations or weather conditions, global, global conditions impact jobs at in local jobs, and uh, and this is happening in every country. So we we just concentrate on that. Thank you exclusively. So I want to ask you two gentlemen to um, just share, and then, and then we can come back and go back and forth. But I'll hand to that one. Okay. Compete. Okay. <laughs> um, from your perspective of recruiting people, hiring people, trying to get the top talent. Um, what do you see as the, both the positives and the negatives that are coming out of our school systems as opposed to any place else in either the country or the world? Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think the a student here is, uh, is lucky than the other parts of the, the United States. Like a Sunset State, uh, I taught uh, computer science courses as there. So Sunset State is a, like a state university. It's not like a Everly or a Berkeley's. But Sunset State, a lot of students, they work for the top companies, Apple, Tesla, Google, because it's so convenient. It is local. So I think it's a lucky for students here. Are, are, you getting, are you getting candidates that have been well-trained for what the needs are in your organization? Uh, it's very competitive because we we uh, hire students from uh, all over. No, that's the country, I'm trying yeah. to get you to make some kind of a comparison. Uh, these these three people over here represent local schools, and uh, and I'm challenging them to do better. That's you know kind of my goal here. And so what I'm asking you is, from your point of view, are they providing you with the candidates you need? And as I said, the student here is lucky because they. Uh, live in the uh, you live in the Silicon Valley, but the bad thing is very competitive. Mm -hmm. Every year, the a top student uh, come here to competing with the with the local student. Uh, I can share some data. So in America, in the United States, about thirteen percent the population uh, was born in out of the the country. In California, about twenty two point five percent population was born outside of the United States. In San Francisco, about 34% of population was born in the, outside of the country. 
here in Silicon Valley in the Santa Clara San Jose area is about 30 close to 38 percent of the population was born in outside of the country I was born in, in China this gentleman was born in Germany yeah, so here is <laughs> so it's very yeah it's a very uh, very very competitive you have to be the best to competing with the best it, it's very tough here EJ you travel all over the world so you're obviously seeking people from all over the world. Um, what, what are we giving you and what, and what are we not giving you that you need? Uh, well, I, I think I have a, a few similar points. I, I think, first of all, here in the Silicon Valley, we are lucky that there is a very international exposure. And exposure means it's not only about our young students, our young fellows, you know, that, who need to go abroad, but it's also, there's a lot of international companies here. And once you join a company, whether it's a French or German, um, Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese company, whatever, you are automatically exposed to that uh, culture. And, and of course also then with the languages. So as such, I think the, the, the international exposure is already there, not only from a point of uh, folks going international um, or, or companies coming in, but it's, we are at a very international place already. So are you saying, both of you, are you saying that our schools are doing a superb job and that you're getting the top candidates from local schools? Well, it's not only the, I mean, the, the, the setup, I would say, with the school and, and just the physical location here in the Silicon Valley is right. Then beyond that, of course, it also it depends on each individual student about his or her further education getting the exposure to the companies. You know, like uh, regardless whether the person, for example, goes out and does an internship at the various companies. Um, you know, in Germany, we have something which is called the dual education system, which means uh, at the end, sort of like before you get ready to, to join the workforce, you, you basically you go uh, three days a week, you go to, to work, and two days out of the week, you go to school. So you get the, 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 the parallel exposure. Uh, we used to have that in New York. I don't know. Do they have it now? Yes. Yeah, if you want, I can uh, speak to that. Yeah, so go ahead. The, the community colleges, certainly Mission College and the others, have a four-credit um, element of education called work experience. And so a student, for example, taking a good course in accounting might be eligible to work in a company and receive credit for that work alongside the credit that he or she is receiving, receiving in the course itself. Or the student may be working full-time or part-time anyway, taking an accounting course, and it could be computer science, it could be any course, and um, uh, taking that course, and then they would be able to get work experience credit in their regular job for that course as well. And that credit is on top of the credit for the course. So if it's a three-credit course, the work experience might earn them at one credit extra, which is really important when you're trying to accumulate enough credits to graduate or to move on to a four-year or wherever you are going. So there is work experience. There's also considerable funding for internships and apprenticeships. And there's a big difference between the two. Apprenticeships traditionally come through the vocational trades. And we have a high-tech apprenticeship grant from the state of California nice. where we're trying to play students in computer science and other related experiences into high-tech companies in an apprenticeship program. It's very hard to get that off the ground. High-tech companies are moving so fast, right? Apprenticeship, what do you mean? Just let me hire the person. Um, but then we also have internships as well. Are they paid? Are the internships paid? Some of them are, some of them aren't. It really depends upon the field. It depends upon um, uh, the grant that supports it. So the state of California, and uh, Julie can attest to this as well, the state is very interested in what they call career technical education or career education as they're now calling it, but CTE or career education is a very important focus for economic and workforce development. And when you think about that, uh, looking at the high school district or the uh, college, um, fields like graphic design, computer uh, science, computer information, culinary, on, in the hospitality, um, uh, nursing, those kinds of fields are funded with grants that support the internships because the internship or the work experience is an important part of the overall education to be prepared for the, for the, for the uh, employment, just like EJ mentioned in, in Europe, in Germany. 
You know, it's interesting as you say that your culinary school is wonderful. Oh, thank you. I have been in several events where we have been uh, honored, actually, to have those kids feed us and, and serve us. And they're cute as can be, but they're, they're incredibly creative in the appetizer dishes in particular that thank they you. serve. Short advertisement, every Tuesday <laughs> and Thursday during the regular semester, we have a bistro open to the public. And the students are actually cooking and presenting as part of, this comes under work experience, as part of the credit that they have to earn in their culinary course. So uh, please stop by on a Tuesday or Thursday, check our website out. Um, I can, I, I, my son works in high tech, he's in San Jose, and he comes up occasionally, we have lunch together at the Bistro. It's, yeah, it's, uh, really, it's really, yeah, it's really fun. fun. So it, it, it makes me think about something. When I was a kid, long before any of the rest of you were born, when I was a kid, we had a commercial track and an academic track. The academic track was for kids that were theoretically going on to college, and the commercial track was to get a job when they got out of high school, basically. Um, and I didn't know then, and I no longer know, you know how we made the, deter the schools made the determination. So it leads me to a question for the three of you, basically, which is, um, how do we, how should we determine a student's individual educational needs, particularly for working in today's international uh, community? I mean, can I, I think back in my day, we forced kids into one track or another, depending on your grades, and um, which to me doesn't sit well. Forcing people into a particular mold doesn't sit well. So, you know, what are we doing? How are we, how are we determining which way to steer our kids? I can answer that. It's not clear unified. There are no tracks that that is, um, that model, yeah, it did exist. Yeah. Um, now it definitely is open. We want college and career ready. Um, just because you go to college, you should still be career ready. There's a lot There's of talk second, about that. My second um, Just because you go to college, we want you to do career after that. I mean, you could live your life in academia, but most parents want you to actually have a job, right? So it's career readiness. Many paths, most paths now, after high school, you can't go and find a job to support yourself. You need some sort of training, post-secondary training, post-secondary for all. Whether it's a community college in 18 months, you can get out with a skill set and go work. That's fantastic. Maybe it's a four-year, maybe it's a professional degree that's six years, eight years out. We want to set them up that they understand all of their options. And, uh, and when you're giving a 17-year-old that choice, they're 17 and we recognize that we need to kind of expose them to all the options because at 17 they might make a decision and make a different decision at 24 and that's okay um i think a lot of our um k through 12 school districts we are following the uc track that's not a negative in any way however sometimes students think if they don't follow that they are unsuccessful or won't have some options at the end and we, we struggle with that a bit um, but there are many ways to success, many pathways, whether it is, um, yeah, direct to a four-year. Um, we definitely have all those options. We want to expose all students to career choices. Um, so I think that um, dual system we had, perhaps, we did have, right? There was a vocational track, and that vocational education doesn't really exist anymore in the sense of, you really can't train with the high tech around here. You need more than after high school training to do anything. So we're really promoting exposure and choice. So this brings me back to my second grade <laughs> experience yes. again. Mm -hmm. you know, I was telling Julie before, um, I, I was given a tour of some of the schools. And one of the schools uh, visited a second grade classroom. And just as you were talking, it occurred to me uh, the teachers, a woman named Hernandez, is that her mm -hmm. woman named Teresa Hernandez? I want to go into the second grade. She was so wonderful. Mm -hmm. But it, she had the kids stand up when they had something to say. She helped them you know, with poise and with, with public speaking mm -hmm. kinds of skills. But also, she helped them with computer literacy because in order to um, observe the lesson on the screen, there were certain kinds of computer things that they had to do. Um, so she was tapping into a number of different modalities of learning that I, I, I was just so impressed. You know, I really wanted to go back into that classroom. So, so which leads me kind of back to my next question is, um, 
and let me give, yeah, give it to Karen. No, At the you. Middlebury level, and Jeff, I'm going to have you do it. You know, what specific courses, what are the specific learning tools, learning objectives, that again, focusing on being able to work in an international environment? Well, uh, the tools that we use are uh, connecting students with the professor. And the environment is like working in an office. So we're always connected to our professor. We have interactions. We submit homework and our projects uh, electronically just that, that those are just the bare basics that everyone does now and we're doing it for every single class. Then we have courses that are shorter. I would say that the courses are far more intensive and far shorter because people do not want to do the required curriculum just as you mentioned. They don't like being, they feel that a lot of classmates felt feel that uh, the curriculum, the mandatory curriculum is is still too rigid. And so the, in, this is graduate school, so we have a lot more flexibility in general and people are self-selected, of course, because not everyone goes to grad school. And people go to grad school are at Middlebury to, uh, to pursue their, their, their projects. And so, there's a lot of support. There is financial support. You can apply for grants. You can apply uh, work uh, project time to count as credit. If you make your proposal, you write proposals. Uh, if you would like to take advantage of those funds that are uh, also that sounds like available in your program and the, we covered the basics and when we go through math, of course it's a graduate program, so a lot of learning is expected to be done outside of class. And you just go to class to touch base with your colleagues face to face and the professor for guidance. And uh, a lot of, it's very independent. It's independent, but people do want to do projects abroad and uh, part of what glues us together is our requirements for 12 credits of language. Uh, and so that, uh, that, that, that requirement, we all are at least bilingual, um, not, not to the native, not to the native level. Not like EJ. <laughs> no, no, no. But we have exposure and interest and we love of languages. And so we all really have, it's like going to a dream, dream school, honestly. It's, uh, I was speaking with you earlier. It's a dream because everyone loves languages and nobody thinks you're weird for loving languages. And everyone knows that it's a value very much that extends your, it makes, it forms a community actually. So yes, it really does. I hope that answered. Uh, Thank you. Give it to Jeff. Give the mic yeah. to Jeff. What was the question again? Just refresh my memory. I don't memory. remember. <laughs> No, I, I was just asking what specific kinds of, what specific, thank you, what, I'm waving all over the place here. What specific kinds of things are done to prepare them for the international part okay. of it? Okay, yeah. okay, good, yeah, just, thanks for, thanks for refreshing. Yeah. Um, I was listening to Karen and I know, I got, I question. got kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, so, when you think of the community college, traditionally we were called the junior college, and traditionally, we're, we were actually focused very much on vocational and trades. But over the years, the state of California and the legislature and the state chancellor's office, as well as the regents of UC and the trustees of California State, realized that the role of the community college is more about, as, I, as you quoted me earlier, an engine of workforce and economic development. And how do we do that, specifically preparing students for the international business world? Um, students who come to us, of course, self-select. And currently, we're under complete revision of our programs under what's called guided pathways. So students will come in, and they will select, with help from counselors, a particular path. And let's stick with culinary as an example. Um, 
So they express an interest or they have a desire to learn the culinary trade, to learn that profession, to, to accelerate their career in culinary. And so we help them with that. And in that program, and in many of our other programs, in addition to, as I said earlier, the hard skills that are necessary, I'm an okay cook, I'm not a great cook, I couldn't really finish the program. In, in addition to those, they have to learn the, schools of, uh, the, the skills of communication, of human interaction. And that's what's common in all of our programs at the community college. So in addition to imparting the very hard skills, whether it's computer science and networking, whether it's um, uh, nursing, obviously nursing in a patient-facing role, it's very important that you are prepared in that human interaction. So for example, we're right now creating a new or revised certificate of global, global business, and in that is required a semester of a language. And the languages range from Arabic to Vietnamese and quite a few in between. And that language skill, even if it's one semester, helps the student understand intellectually and at an emotional level the value of communication and, quite frankly, how hard it really can be. So that's one of the very many tools that we use uh, to help prepare students for the international business world. You know, it's interesting that you used culinary as, as an example because it was, again, you know, I've been to a number of these events and the, the, the students have to serve the, the audience. Right. They come out with their trays serving and so they, they, they're interrupting conversations or trying not to interrupt conversations. And, uh, and it, it is, you're right, it's part of the soft skill training. You wouldn't think about that when you think culinary, but it's certainly, you know, I've seen that, yeah. You wouldn't even think of it in terms of computer science. You know, the, the typical high-tech worker is sitting in front of a screen in a big open office and nobody's talking. And that is absolutely not true. No. And I wind up, a lot of the consulting I do is to wind up to teach just those people how to be human yeah. and how to, <laughs> how to interact with the rest of the world. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I have one more question for the education team and then I'm going to kind of switch it here to the corporate team. Uh, and that is slightly, it's slightly off topic, but do you experience a sense of broad-mindedness? Uh, I mean, are we te teaching our kids that, that there are many right ways, not just my way is the right way, my town is the right way to do things? I'll give a very short answer and then I yeah. certainly... Um, currently, we are under a legislative directive in the state of California, which is not asking, but requiring us to let students coming out of high school or coming into the college self-select transfer level math and English, take them in the first year and complete them in the first year. Now, in the past, students would take remediation in math and English forever and ever and ever. It would take them three, four, five, six, ten years to graduate. But the, the, the data shows, and this is nationwide data shows, that the quicker the student accelerates through that transfer level English and math, the more successful they will be in the future. So one of the broad-mindedness that we're required to impart to students is that don't be afraid, try it and see. And then we have all of the support mechanisms behind that student, and we're just launching this new initiative. Oh, nice. Nice to hear about that. Julie, you and I were talking about that a little bit before. Sure. Um, K-12, as we, there's a saying, playing well in the sandbox. I don't know if that translates. Um, from, right, we have five-year-olds we are teaching to get along with each other. So half of our curriculum is social-emotional learning. That's become very prevalent right now in K-12, trauma-informed practices, because they come to your classroom um, with a lot. Um, great experience is not so great, and that interferes with maybe some of it they're learning. Um, so we definitely want our students to be curious, creative, um, resilient. All these soft skills, um, assets, life skills, no matter, and that is going to serve them well throughout their, their life. It's not just a career choice, but whether it's a global or they're going to take over their parents' you know, restaurant. We have a great culinary program, too. We have a restaurant <laughs> on Friday, so you can hit them Tuesday, Thursday, hit us on Friday. I had to make that shout out to our culinary program that feeds hey, Diana, theirs. we can get them to compete yes. and have yeah. feed us. Feed us. <laughs> right, sorry. Oh, I, had, yeah. I had to say that. If anyone sees this film, my teachers would be... Um, See, I was remiss of not mentioning that. 
Yes, yes, that's great too. Um, so we really are being mindful. We, we, and one piece of it I think is really important too, our teacher training on teaching our teachers how to teach to that's a global really audience, yeah. giving them exposure. We have really worked with them um, on growth mindset, their own, and instilling that in their students, right? Because you have to practice to be able to teach it. That's our belief in Santa Clara Unified. Um, getting them out to corporations and hearing from HR directors because they might have gone through the system K through 12, gone to San Jose State, got back in the classroom, where uh, there's many many teachers that have gone to industry like I did and went went back to education later in their career and they bring a different lens. And we really are trying to get our teachers out to see what it looks like. Um, I will say some of our challenges um, when we talk about exposure to this. Um, when I was teaching 15 years ago, we had many internship opportunities. Unemployment rate looked different. They can, now they can get a college grad to work at Cisco or do an internship for maybe free just to get that exposure. They don't want my 15 Cisco students. So we have some challenges when the economy is good. It's hard for us to, for companies, they don't, I want to say they don't need us, but we're not, they have other opportunities that they can pursue that make more sense economically for them. So we're trying to expose doing the many jobs that a K through 12 teacher wants to do. Um, but again, we're also trying to expose our teachers to that so they understand the importance and prioritizing that in the classroom. Well, you and I should talk off, offline about the teach the teachers part of all of that. Julie, you got the mic. Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, there are two yeah, more right. programs I'd like to mention specifically, but Miss has multiple, multiple pop-up programs just initiated by students and that's very encouraged it's like a uh, educational incubator for all the students there's funding for any project you want to do even if it's a short-term project but the the two i'd like to mention are the that are part of the curriculum are the 12-hour credit of of uh language requirement is not just a uh, language but it could be in it's intercultural communication and so you can take 12 hours of French, which I did, or, uh, or you could take a multiple small, shorter courses of inter intensive intercultural communication curriculum. And it's, a, it's a practically a certificate you could get if you want to do it a standalone during a semester. They have experts to uh, support uh, true, uh, true healing healing and inter intercultural communication if there happens to be uh, difficulties between two cultures that are attempting to communicate, which happens uh, all historically the all the time. And there's a lot of healing to be done. But uh, part of the French, it's not just French uh, writing and grammar that we're learning. Uh, we, are, we're, we, we did a current events in uh, Francophone, Francophone Frank, francophone countries, which includes African countries and many Caribbean countries. And we read um, articles about current events in those countries, which is actually something I never, ever, ever had done before, even though it was easily, it's easily available online. And so hearing um, the media voice from the local, local writers and uh, Usually they're very they're they're more sophisticated articles. They're not they're not drama, dramatic articles. Or, or they're more politically oriented articles. So that was really wonderful to read. I I didn't really know the relationship between the the uh, African culture, for example, and the Arab culture. In, in North Africa. There is, a, there is a complex, of course, history. And we did a, several articles. We did a study on that. And then uh, finally, so, so that's the curriculum in language is, is substantive curriculum, not just um, I went to the store or how to buy. It's not survival French. It's substantive to the graduate program that you're Jean in. Appel. Do yeah, well, that's, that's super that's important that's too, right? That's super important too. That's all I remember. Yes, and the other years one, of studying French. Oh, yeah, that's nice. There's that's a great book called French or Faux, <sighs> and it was written by 
uh, no, Learning to Bow is written by the junior high school teacher. But anyway, there's a great book called French Ruffel, which talks about the, the, mostly the Parisian culture, but the French culture, and, uh, and how the fact that it's not kissy sweet doesn't mean that it's hostile. And it's really worth reading. There's another book called Learning to Bow, uh, which has to do with the Japanese culture and learning teamwork. And I've got to put a plug in for my own book here. So I, one of my books is Culture Inside the Company and Outside the Country. And I obviously read those other books and have taken from them. But uh, so just a whole bunch of interesting things about the, the variations in culture and, uh, and how they affect interpersonal relationships. Oh, yes. Yes, that's, that's wonderful. I spent some time in Japan. Yeah, so I know I you have can appreciate yeah, you've been around. The difficult. So, yeah. Well, all right. Well, thank okay. you. Okay, EJ, I have a question for you. Um, okay, as an international recruiter, share some stories about finding senior executives here, as contrasted to finding them in some of the other countries that you serve. Just do some comparisons. Um. Well, I mean, it all depends again, in, uh, you know, on the specific uh, country we are looking at. But if, if I remember back, for example, in Japan, um, when we had some um, uh, some some potential candidates lined up uh, for the company, it was very important that you had the family of the candidate, you know, to buy in. So, so which is something which, of course, we are not used to over here, right? So, you know, you, you talk directly to the candidate and you convince the candidate, depending on the, uh, on, on the source spots, you know, like why is the candidate open to leave and, you know. Uh, but again, at the time, you know, it was a matter of like uh, uh, getting the buy-in of the family. So we, on, on the recruiting side, we had to reach uh, out directly and talk to, to the wife of the candidate and, and also to the parents to convince them why this is the right move. So, so this is one, one of the, the, the cultural differences. Huh? Uh, now, having said that, I have also seen examples of uh, the other way around, where um, regardless whether it's, uh, again, German, French, Italian company, whatever, or an Asian company, uh, expanding here in, in the, the valley, where, let's say, in their home market, they are the top company. And any candidate who made it to that company, joined that company in their home market, then basically they, they made it to the top. Right? Whereas if they are here in the Silicon Valley, there is, as, as we talked earlier, there is so much competition. And it doesn't matter anymore which company you are coming from, what you are in your home market. Here, there is the global competition for all the global companies. And I would say that's maybe one of the, the biggest differences. Status is less important. The status of the company. Uh, well, it's the status then here in in the in the market you are recruiting, rather than in the home market. Yes. Do you want to add to that? I think yeah. I think the here is more competitive. So I have a question specifically about China. So when I was in China, which is either eighty four or eighty five, I can never remember. Um, one of the things that I was taught was that uh, a Chinese person did not have the freedom to move from one company to the other if his immediate supervisor or boss didn't let him. Um, and um, the, the other thing that was interesting is I was helping an American company interview a bunch of, of Chinese uh, people. And, uh, and it turned out through the translator that they, quote, all knew the right answers, unquote meaning the translator was the expert and every single candidate who was answering the, the, you know, the translator was answering the questions. So we devised a, you know, a, a nonverbal questionnaire for them. But I know things have changed radically. Um, but when you're dealing with people from China or, or that you're recruiting or you're working with, um, what is happening today in terms of their, their freedom of choice? Uh, China changed uh, quite a lot uh, for the past uh, 10 years. Now China is the second largest uh, economy uh, in the world. Uh, a lot of millionaires, billionaires, very young, like Tesla owners. In America, Tesla owners, Tesla Model X owners over 50 year old. But in China, it's much younger. And uh, in, this, in the valley, about more than 200 Chinese companies, uh, Chinese investor companies. Like my company, 
SF Motors is five minutes from here in, the, in the one of the buildings. We hire more than 200 uh, people here. And, and there's a company called uh, Neo. They hire 600 people. And their company, Biden, they hire 500 people. Tencent America hire more than 200 people. So actually, there's a lot of uh, Chinese companies in the Silicon Valley. They, they create a lot of jobs. Uh, so I want to maybe talk, uh, share with the, the education, uh, the schools. Maybe you can tell the student more open-minded because Chinese companies, they pay more than, some they pay more than the American companies. The reason is simple, because they, the, the name, they, they never heard about them, they're not famous. See, if they want to hire people from Google, Tesla, Apple, they have to pay a premium, maybe 20%, maybe 50%, maybe double the salary. Otherwise, why they, they work for unknown foreign companies? So these create the opportunities that the student here, local student here, more open-minded. If a company you never heard of them, but probably pay more. <laughs> Very interesting, EJ. Yeah, I, if I may just add to this one, I, I think also it's it's a matter of like uh, companies sort of like building the the reputation over the time. I mean, of course, if you talk about the you know the the, the local giants like the Googles, the the Facebooks, they, they are known, right? Uh, SF Motors is maybe still uh, still a newcomer, right? So so it's a matter of building a, a reputation. Uh, what we also see, sort of like in, in with with foreign companies, is that uh, sometimes also candidates that they feel when they join a foreign company or where the head office is is in a foreign country, is that they reach a certain ceiling. And then they can't go beyond that because typically the, the top management positions are occupied by the people who come from the home country. But that's not uh, unique to, to China. That's, you know, with German companies, French, Italian, it, it's, it's all the same. I was at Genesis when Alcatel bought them out. I was consulting to Genesis. And um, all decisions were made over the pond, as it were that the, the upper management group that had been at Genesis at that time, including me as a consultant, all left because the Alcatel people were so insistent that only, only the French could hold those, those upper levels. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had also, we had stories where sort of like then the, 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 the local manager from a, a foreign country sort of like, uh, you know, the, we brought the candidates in front of them well, they were in front of the, the, the hiring manager because we whispered something in, in their ear, right? So, and then the, the hiring manager says, oh, here, so you want to work for our company? And the candidate said, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I'm here because the folks at Yes Partners whispered something in my ear, said, uh, be open to it. So, so it's, uh, what, what is very often mistaken is like, it's, it's a matter, you have to sell, you have to promote the company so that they are convinced, and, and I agree, you know, that the, the, the money is a, is a big part of it. Yeah. Um, there is maybe other incentives also, depending on the, the, the source spot of the candidate. Yeah, there's, uh, there's this whole sense of esprit de corps, pride in being in a particular company. And if you look at some of our companies that will remain nameless, because I don't want to get sued, um, it, you know, they, they beat employees up. They, you know, they're on call 24-7, but these companies are considered the best to be working for. We, I'm looking at the clock and I realize that we have to uh, wrap up. So I have a question that, that I'd like you to kind of talk to each other about and I'll hand over the mic to, uh, I'll give it to you since you're in the middle of those. Two. And that is, what do you as educators want from the people who are doing the hiring that's gonna enable you to give better to your students and what do you need from education that's going to enable you to hire more local talent, as it were. So, have um, Especially, in our, I'm going to speak to our high school because they're the closest we have to the workforce. Um, we have programs from, we have auto shop, what you might, and we're doing clean fuels. It's not your grandfather's auto shop, right? It, it is, it's evolved. We have biotech programs, we have graphic design, we have entrepreneurship and marketing programs at the high school level. Um, my two, pro the two programs I run right now, um, one's competing in Delaware in an international program this week with entrepreneurs and promoting their product, if you will, and another team's in Tampa. 
we are doing things at the high school level, but we do need um, industry support to guide um, as it's ever evolving. Education tends to be a little slow. Yes, yes, so I, I, um, we are seeking that support. Um, I know we talk different languages sometimes and our systems are different, but I, I, my teachers are craving that they're trying to do the best for their students, but the input. So um, again, we have such a variety of programs that our high school students are doing and they're excited about and they can't wait to come and work for those, I mean, startups and that enthusiasm, as much as 17 year olds might not know what they want to do or think they have it all figured out, they are enthusiastic to get out there in the real world. Um, and we could argue that they're living the real world too. We have to be careful with that term because, you know, their reality is their reality. We can't say that. Um, and depending on, but that's what I ask. I'm really coming to the table with us, um, having, they want to hear from you, they want to see you, they want to see someone like them standing in front of the classroom going, I could be them. It's really powerful for students to hear from um, the non-teacher or not mom and dad. <laughs> really powerful. So that's what I would say. Oh, thanks. Um, lots of things come to mind in what you're talking about, site visits and guest lectures. So students going to the company or a company executive coming to the classroom is certainly two things that are very important. We'd like to see more of that. Uh, but just to give you an, uh, a little bit more of legislative stuff, we are required in our career te technical education programs to hold an annual advisory board. Nick, you joined us for the business meeting last year. Thank you. Um, this is required of our career technical education. Okay. So, yeah, so our computer science, we're holding it very soon. Um, accounting, all of the career technical education, hospitality management, fire protection technology, early childhood development, just to name a few. Um, so that's another way in which industry can come to us, meeting with faculty, not just administrators, right. but faculty. Teachers are there. Teachers are there because we're making sure that our curriculum and the content in the course is relevant to the job skills that are needed at the employers. That's just required by legislation. But there are other things too. For example, last weekend we had a two-day hackathon. This was run by faculty from computer science, graphic design, business, and MESA, which is the Math Engineering Science um, Association, which is a funded program. And the hackathon was open to Mission College students. They get together and form teams. We had 42 students, we had six teams. Two of them had, uh, actually eight teams, I'm sorry. Two of them had one extra uh, individual. And then industry people are the judges. So they get together, they, f they create a product, and they create a business plan, okay? And usually the product is some kind of an app, of course, computer science and graphic design, so they're looking at the uh, uh, user interface. But then they have to create a business plan and then make a pitch. So the first day they form their team, they start working, they have coaches, faculty that help them, and industry people that help them. The second day they finalize it, put it together, and make a presentation. That's another example where industry can help us. Here's another example. We have a portfolio night coming, which is part of a capstone course in our graphics design program, where the students actually pitch their design. And so there'll be 15 or 16 students in our hospitality management suite. And we're inviting many, in fact, I believe we're inviting members of the chamber. We've contacted uh, Nick and we're inviting members of the chamber, as well as a lot of other um, uh, industry intermediary organizations and industry partners and so forth to come and view the students because this is good practice for the students and in many cases the students are looking for employment and here's an opportunity. Small companies, large companies, middle-sized companies. So there's two ways in which companies can interface more directly with our students and that's really important. It's with our students but then with the college itself in terms of internship, apprenticeship, work experience opportunities, site visits, guest lectures as well, very important for us. And in terms of one of the things about Silicon Valley, things change rapidly, right? The only thing that doesn't change is change itself. So we need to be as forward looking as we can. As, as Julie mentioned, it takes a little while for us to do things. Curriculum review and new course approvals have to go through the state chancellor's office, through our board of trustees and so forth. Um, it's a whole very, very rigorous process. But we need to be looking forward. And so if employers and the hiring organizations for employers are thinking, 
two, three, four years in advance, we need their help now. So that's the other way. Help us develop those new programs. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm clock watching, and we, we're a little bit over on time. So let me, I'm going to pass you if you don't mind. Let me ask the two of you kind of the, the opposite question, which is what more do you want education to do to make it easier for you to get the right candidates from local schools? Okay, so if I, if I may start. So I, I think uh, the, the school's uh, education system is already on the right track. I think at the end of the day, what you can provide is exactly that. You know, the education, the, 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 the openness to, to different companies. You already elaborated, you know, whether it's internships or bringing companies in. This is great. You need the candidates to be open to, to those international uh, companies. Huh? I have heard also from young folks before, it's like once they left school and, and joined the company, then they were told, okay, listen, you have an MBA, great. Now forget everything you learned in school. Yes. Right? Because now you start work. Right? So it's completely different. Huh? So, so in that sense, I think you, the, the education system is in the right track. Makes the students interested and open to the different cultures and the different companies. And then maybe on, on a second issue also with, with languages, um, um, which obviously is all your, uh, in, in your curriculums, right? I mean, it's, that's a big issue. Uh, I always um, was interested in languages in terms of like being able to communicate and learn about the other folks. Huh? Um, and, and, and of course, it's not only the, the language, but it's also, it's, it's understanding again the culture. It's like, for example, like one of the first times when I traveled into Latin America, I, was, I, I always thought mañana means tomorrow. Said, no, it's not. Mañana means not today. <laughs> tomorrow, maybe. So, uh, I mean, stupid example, but it's just. It's, no, it's, it's a great it's example culture. because from the it's, German cu uh, culture, right. which is totally accurate on time, precise. Right, right. So, so, so in, in, in that sense. And then also, I mean, I'm sure Jeff and I, with, with our history with Japan, I'm sure we could uh, share a lot of stories about the karaoke and drinking evenings. And, <laughs> and, 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 but again, it's part of the culture. And as such, languages provide the opportunity to communicate and learn about the cultures. And, and the more effort you make, and I've seen it so many times, you are more and more welcome with open arms uh, from the other side. I'm going to let you have the f almost final word because I get the final word. Go ahead. I, I, I think the, the schools should teach the, some ugly side about the life. It's, California is a sun, sunny state. But under the sun, a lot of competition. Yes. If they're not good enough, it's hard to survive. All the cars are autonomous driving. No need driver. If you want to be an Uber driver in the future, no. No chance to be an Uber driver. All the factories are robots. So it's a lot of competition in the future for the kids. So I think this is the ugly side. Mm -hmm. So the, the Bay Area housing price is four times the, of the nation's housing price. I attended a, 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 a small gathering. One of the famous writers says in the, in the audience, say, if you're not good enough in the Silicon Valley, you can't buy a house. You have, you have to be good. You have to be the best to competing with the best. So it's the tough side. So somehow the teacher should let the student know to be, to be tough. That's it's so, no, no, it's so important what you're saying. It's a great way to wind this up. We have here in our education system this belief that you don't want to hurt their egos. And people, you know, especially, uh, you know, in the younger grades, whether they've learned it or not, you move them to the next grade because it's not right to hurt their little egos and you don't correct. And they haven't learned that good enough isn't good enough. You know, and there's a wonderful poem, I can't think of the, the author, called Good Enough Isn't Good Enough. And I, so I love that as an ending. I thank you all very, very much for your time, for your, your insights. Um, ask you to please stick around if you can, because we didn't have any chance for audience questions. I see a, yes? We don't have time. But the, but the panel will informally after we uh, get off of the podium here. Okay, I'm sorry, we ran out of time.